Testing, testing. Testing, testing. Hello, hello. Yeah, perfect. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Juan Pablo Solis. I'm the Senior Advisor for Climate and Environment at FedTrain International. So it is my pleasure today to host you in our event, um, transitioning or understanding climate justice in trade, uh, how to Im improve, let's say, resilience at farm level, adopting practices, and so on forth. One second. <laughs> Always happen now. So, just to give a bit of an introduction, uh, fair trade global strategy. It's very clear that in order to achieve sustainable livelihoods and all the targets that we want uh, to improve the livelihoods in the communities, we have to tackle climate change. There's uh, there's a critical role of both sides of the value chain, the consumers and the producers. And on one side of the market, there's this need for products that have a lower footprint. And on the other side of the uh, value chain, at the producing level, there's this urgency for adaptation. This is something we have been building on, on an understanding. And I'm happy to present uh, our theory of change, our strategy to combat climate change, climate and environment is built on an ultimate goal to enable producers and workers increase their capacities to cope with environmental risks and therefore strengthen their capacities to combat and increase their climate resilience. The strategy is divided in three parts. The first one that we call climate actions is building again these capacities among smallholder producers and higher labor organizations to implement climate action, cl cl climate adaptation and climate mitigation uh, activities. The second pillar is external positioning. It's connecting fair trade with the wider climate movement. But we want to connect that, increasing the evidence for, advocacy, for advocate for climate justice. This is a bit the, the, the argument, the, 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 the reason why the fair trade movement wants to be involved fighting for climate justice. And the third element is that recognizing that we need to also raise our own awareness, increase our own capacities, and therefore we need to partner with the right organizations to move this agenda forward. And now I have with me Caroline from, from our uh, producer network organization in Africa, Fairtrade Africa. Uh, we want to demonstrate a bit uh, the type of products that are Fairtrade certified. Most of you that have been here in and out have been trying our coffee, chocolate bars, tea in the pavilion. Uh, so Caroline, come. Bring a mic. So in the pavilion, we have coffee, tea, mini chocolate bars, fruits, sugar, right? And all come from fair trade certified producers. Tell us a little bit more about these produ products. Um, OK, great. Thank you. Uh, so one of the things that a wise man said, you need three types of friends, a policeman, a good lawyer, and a farmer. Can you imagine if you didn't have a farmer, you wouldn't get to enjoy all these products. And so um, as Juan Pablo has rightly put, all these products have been produced by fair trade certified farmers from Africa. Uh, so we have tea. We all love tea. And what they say is 70,000 cups of tea are consumed every second. So can you imagine how many cups will have been consumed by the time I'm done talking? So this Kericho Gold is, comes from Kenya. This is um, a trader. They source from four producer organizations in Uganda and in Kenya. And one of the things that the, these producers are currently doing is a project on climate action 
that uh, uh, where they are, you know, change, using renewable energy to to stop uh, deforestation. So they are using solar panels um, and uh, using macadamia shells to, you know, to as an alternative source of energy. Then, so this is tea, and they're really good cool teas, uh, green tea, love tea. So really good tea. So this is coffee, again from Kenya. This is one of my personal favorite, mostly because it has been produced by women in Kenya. So this, the, uh, it has been produced roasted and packed by women. Um, I think one of the things that we discussed yesterday uh, by our uh, producer from Ghana is women are really, really getting into, you know, taking action in their hands because they're suffering. We know they're struggling when it comes to, you know, climate change is reducing the food on the table. And so what women are doing is they're coming up and actually taking actions and looking for ways to make money. So that is our de coffee. Uh, produced by women in Kenya and then we have chocolate which is a favorite snack this is from Ivory Coast um, some of the things that the Ivory Coast producers are doing and Ghana producers again this chocolate is from Ghana sourced from, it is, is in the UK but has been sourced from uh, West Africa Ghana and um, Ivory Coast again this is a product that you can find everywhere I'm sure when you're leaving the airport try and grab one of these. Mass as well, really good chocolate. Um, sourced from West Africa in Ivory Coast and Ghana. And some of the projects that they are doing uh, are, you know, working on, the, on deforestation, ensuring that they are reducing their carbon footprint. Um, and then we have organic sugar from Mozambique. Um, some of these uh, producers are actually working really hard to ensure that they are reducing their carbon fr footprint. And one of the things the Mozambique farmers are doing is uh, ensuring that they are reducing their waste. One, reducing their waste, but also minimizing their tillage uh, so that they maintain uh, the health of the soil. Then there's fruit. This is from Egypt. So we have a producer organization in Egypt called Dalte. Uh, they do fruits and vegetables. Um, if you have by any chance passed by the VIP room in that corner, we have a bowl of fruits where you are able to enjoy uh, some of these. So these are just some of the products. This is not all. We have thousands of products available across the world. Um, so how do you identify a fair trade product? This is the label. So all these products have labels. So whenever you are in retail in a supermarket, ensure that you pick one of the products. The one thing that we keep saying is fair trade goes beyond certification. So this is certification where they follow standards that respect the environment, respect the producer, but obviously they have to really, you know, taking care of the workers and the farmers who are across the supply chain. But the other thing we also do is um, ensuring that the traders, uh, who especially these ones, so these ones are not producers, but they are traders. But what they do is they, fa they pay a fair price. So a big challenge that has been across, uh, you know, production is where producers have not been able to negotiate for good prices. So what Fairtrade has done is to ensure that a minimum price is paid and the minimum price caters for any shocks that come in the market. So during COVID, for instance, prices went up and down, uh, but what the Fairtrade standard has is a minimum price that ensures that when the prices go down, the producer still gets a fair price covers, that covers for sustainable production and a small profit for them. But above that, there's a fair trade premium, which then covers for all community projects. So what happens is every farmer who, uh, who is within fair trade and sells on fair trade terms is able to earn an extra income that then they go back and invest in the community, building hospitals, building schools, taking their children to, uh, to school and all that. And so what that does is it helps the farmer, but also the community. Was that a lot? Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Thank you. Applauses. Now, you will see now that in Fairtrade, we are really committed to improve our standards, make these standards compliance with market regulations, but also go one step further, adopting agroecological practices, helping the producers, setting up programs and projects to support these communities, and also do the right advocacy raising the voices of farmers and workers in events like this. 
with me. If you have questions after, we, br we brought Suli and uh, Debra. They are producers, both of them. Suli is a coffee producer from Guatemala, and Debra is a cocoa producer from, what, from Ghana, sorry. And they are part of our um, Fair Trade Ambassadors program, a part of an educational program that we are also supporting new generations, especially women, in moving forward. But we know that we cannot do this alone, and therefore we are looking for the right partners. And actually, I'm very glad to have here with me Molly Harris, the Director for Strategic Partnerships, uh, partnerships in Australia New Zealand, uh, Fair Trade Australia New Zealand, sorry, and Harriet Lamb, the, uh, the CEO, right, of Ashton Foundation. <laughs> I always confuse the, the titles, so apologies for that. But uh, with Ashton uh, in Fair Trade Australia New Zealand, in Fair Trade International, we have been working a lot to how to uh, in, in increase the scale of these actions further. So, please, Molly, first question. Why investing in smallholder farmers to scale climate solutions? Thank you, Juan Pablo. Um, this is an extraordinary venue, so I hope, I hope every can, everyone can hear. Just to set a tiny bit of, of context to this very significant challenge that we all face, when we think about um, how to address what's going on in climate change, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. When we think about how we're all going to address climate change, one of the things that we also have to keep in mind is that there are more than 10 major human-induced catastrophic risks on the planet right now that all of us are dealing with and farmers at the very basic level are, are certainly dealing with, whether it's the pandemic or the water crisis or the, the, the um, toxicity in various environments. So we are, we are dealing with complex systems now and we have to have a systemic approach to solve them. So Jeffrey Sachs actually was in this very room recently, um, and one of the things he said at a pre-food summit recently was about the system that we have and how broken it is and how it's not based on minimum human rights or standards that, that all people should be able to um, have. Uh, it's, it's a broken system based on multilateral investments, based on very few transfers to communities that need it, based on very few supporting local communities or farmers. So we really do have to kind of think about what is the systemic problem so that we can actually solve that systemic problem with farmers, not for farmers, with farmers, who can actually help us all to become more planet friendly, to enable not just human species to survive, but actually the rest of life on Earth that's with us. So this whole program and partnership that we developed um, with Ashton is really around what is the role that uh, small farmers can play and why would we engage small farmers in these important uh, activities to fix the climate, to draw carbon back down, to fix the biodiversity, to, to deal with water issues and, and uh, natural resource depletions. Those are some of the 10 interacting uh, crises we have. And what, a, what, what struck us was that actually fair trade is quite remarkable in many, many ways. For 30 years, it has been uh, piloting an alternative trading system that is the only globally scaled trading system that actually focuses on fair prices, on bringing consumers and corporates into the, the value of fair trade to buy from the farmers at a fair price and enables farmers to do that. So we thought, well, what, what's, the, what's the next iteration of what we could be doing to really help the world solve these problems? And with farmers, nearly two million of them across 75 countries, uh, we as a world have the opportunity to engage these farmers that are well-governed, well-organized, to actually help us solve the climate crisis by having partners like Ashton who enable us to address critical challenges, whether they are agricultural challenges. There's many, many methodologies that actually many of these products would, would profile for us that are doing specific things to help the climate. We can actually bring agroecologists to support farmers on the ground to help us to improve the soils, improve the productivity, draw down the carbon, protect the biodiversity in a way that systemically across these 75 countries implements programs that will help the whole world 
solve the climate crisis. So one of the first things that we want and one of the reasons for working with small farmers is they can help us, the world, solve these agricultural challenges in a climate um, positive way if we enable them to have the right tools and if partnerships can enable them to do that. Um, so I guess what, what we ultimately are thinking is that if we can pivot, you know, there's been so much discussion around the problems that farmers have and they do have many. Um, but it's not just about mitigation. We've sort of passed, lost that boat. Um, it, it is about adaptation very much so. But we, we sincerely believe that these farmers can actually lead the change towards climate positive, climate healthy uh, environmental agriculture in ways that help the whole world to address and draw down this carbon. And we think that pivoting farmers into that leadership role with support from a variety of partners could really, really be the difference to help the farmers, yes, but actually to, to support the rest of the world to address this really, really critical issue. So maybe that's enough for the moment, to, um, to and we might uh, move to Harriet to talk about the energy. Sure, that reminds me something that one of our producers from the Philippines told me the other day. Farmers are determined to combat climate change. But now I'm curious to know, then Harriet, what is the role of the energy sector here? Thank you so much, Juan Pablo, and uh, good morning, everyone, here in this very noisy room, but also good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone online, where you have the joy of listening much more quietly uh, to this discussion. And today at COP27 here in Egypt, it's Energy Day. So it couldn't be a better day to be having this discussion and it's also meant to be the implementation COP. This is all about how do we actually get work done on the ground. And so that's also the focus of this uh, wildly ambitious idea that we have about how could 1.9 million fair trade smallholder farmers lead the way to become climate positive by 2030. And if they're going to do that, it's absolutely critical that we all break out of the silos that we all work in every day, logically, because we're all very focused. But in fact, if we're going to get the kind of systems transformation that we need, we've got to have systems approaches. And that means bringing together people who are working in energy and they're real energy nerds, bringing them together with people who care about farming and about supply chains and bringing that all together into one approach that can really enable the farmers to adapt to the climate crises that they face and to become more resilient. And indeed, the farmers have been banging the table for years now saying we're facing the climate crisis and we don't have the resources to be in the leadership role that we need. Now, we heard already some brilliant examples of some of the initiatives that farmers are already doing to seek to become climate positive. And the, I think that really illustrates what we believe is the, f the solutions are already out there. We have the solutions that we need. The question is, are we distributing them evenly? And are we taking them to scale? And so that, again, is what we're seeking to do. And let me give you one example of Ionese. They're a, a smallholder producer group in Ghana, uh, growing coconuts, and then processing the coconuts for coconut oil. And the processing factory needs power. Oh, it's over there. It's not me. <laughs> and the factory needs power. That power is currently run by using the husks from the coconut, so it's really brilliant, but it's not very efficient. It's not coming to the heat they need. So they want to invest in improving that furnace. Then they want to invest in working with the women of the co-op to have three clean cooking facilities that they can power off renewable energy to enable those women to have livelihoods and then to roll out clean cooking to all the households within the co-op. And then they want to do more on agroforestry, intermixing the coconut trees with other trees 
but that takes training and capacity building. And then they want to do awareness raising. They want to run radio programs, for example, to raise awareness among the community about the dangers of deforestation. So they've got a holistic plan that's integrating everything from the needs of the individual women smallholders through to the needs of the factory, but they need capital investment to do it. But it's one example to show how the farmers are there, they know what they need to do to reach zero carbon, to become climate positive, and what we need to do is see how can we leverage that right through the supply chain. And so the energy we're talking about, we're not talking about massive grid, we're talking here about distributed rural energy, which is actually power in the hands of the producers themselves. And that then enables them to be flexible and using that, whether it's for processing, whether it's for cooling, whether it's for transporting their products to market. All along the supply chain, you need power. And they want to shift to renewable, either to scale it up or to get rid of using diesel or to get rid of cutting down trees, which, for example, some of the big tea factories, they still dry the tea using uh, wood cut down, which is obviously a need to move away from that to more renewable sources of energy, but decentralized rural energy that's within the hands and within the grasp of the farmers. And in particular, because these smallholder farmers are already organized in groups, so that you've already got enough of that aggregation, if you like, to make it work. And so we're hearing all these examples from the farmers about what they'd like to do. To give you one more example, a coffee co-op in Brazil, they've got 54 members. They already have solar on their office. They then put solar on their processing facilities, but now they want to roll that out. So each and every one of their 54 members has access to energy at home through a solar home system. And it's that, again, it's some of these examples about working with the smallholder at the center. So you're, they're not just farmers, they're members of their community and indeed they're leaders in their community, which is also why we believe working with fair trade can have that wider ripple effect. That these leaders, some of the brilliant fair trade ambassadors that are here today, they're leaders who can talk about that in the, with the next co-op, with the next co-op, with other coffee producers, but also with other smallholder farmers around the world. So in a way, working in energy is a way to empower communities. I, exactly. It's the power to empower communities. It's a power to Absolutely. empower. Absolutely. Brilliant, brilliant phrase. Now, very briefly, um, we haven't introduced Ashton. So you can talk very briefly about Ashton, the foundation. Thank you. So Ashton is a organization dedicated to climate solutions, uh, quite similar to Fairtrade in that we believe that the positive living alternative is already there. The solutions are out there. We just need to scale them up. And we need to show, as Molly was saying, the positive solutions that exist and really think together how can we scale them up. So that's what Ashton is all about. It's about putting the spotlight on the positive solutions. Now, going back to the questions, how do we make this transformative? <laughs> the easy part, <laughs> Juan Pablo. Um, how do we make this, this transition? Um, well, I think Profoundly and first, we have to get out of our silos, as Harriet mentioned. We, we all have been working, many of us, for 30 or 40 years on these problems. And somehow, oh, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so how do we make this transition? Um, I guess the first and foremost is we have to get out of our, our silos because we have all, many of us, been working, many, many, probably everyone in this room for probably decades, um, trying to solve these problems in very specific ways. And we've got to recognize those inter interactive cat catastrophic risks that are out there and what are the systemic ways that we can have interventions that can address multiple risks at the same time. So if we're supporting small farmers to have good agroecology practices that are drawing carbon from the atmosphere for all of us into their soils that are now healthier and more productive, and we're enabling them to have good renewable energy 
as, as they should have. It's a basic human right to be able to have your children reading at night for their studies or whatever it is. So I I if we can solve these problems simultaneously and identify what are the opportunities to actually solve multiple problems at once that that systemically address these issues, then we can really, uh, uh, you know, get get much further, much much faster. Which is why a partnership with something like, you know, renewable energy and access to renewable energy and access to the tools and the resources that would help farmers do the very best agricultural practices that would help all of us so solve our climate problem. Those are solving multiple issues at the same time. And for, for absolutely minuscule amounts of resources, if we think about the, the, the problems that the world has, the, the money we've spent just on the pandemic, for example, th this is a teeny, teeny bit of resource that will mobilize two million farmers in the first instance. And, and I want to just make one important point about this sort of transition. The reason fair trade is such an amazing partner to have in this context is because the farmers that are working with fair trade are half owners of the whole global system of fair trade, which means they are half of the global board and half of the general assembly. These are not just empowered farmers. These are farmers that own an alternative globally scaled ethical trading system. And so to work with them, they're well governed, they're transparently audited, there's just many, many aspects of governance across the fair trade system that enable these multiple countries and multiple products to actually adopt and address these problems systematically. And so fair trade, I think, is the, is the organization that can actually then help the other 500 million farmers, or however many it is, I think it's 500 million farmers, small farmers in the world, that need to have access to the same methodologies and the same resources to actually address farming in their community. So we think this is a, a good, it's almost like a globally scaled pilot that can help farming everywhere. And I also really believe that if you go back to Jeffrey Sachs and his points about how broken the current farming system is, fair trade farmers implementing a program like this in a systemic way could actually prove to the rest of farming in North America, in Canada, in Australia and New Zealand, actually there's a different method of farming which enables community and family farms to exist, doing sound in ecological approaches and good energy approaches to the problems that we all face in ways that mobilize us to solve these problems in a reasonable time period that enables life on Earth to progress. So, so I think we, we have a big transition. It does seem like it's almost impossible, uh, but it is not impossible if we actually can do it in a, in a coherent and systematic way, enabling communities, for instance, to control their carbon, to control their energy. Um, we, we enable the whole world to be able to do this much faster and much more efficiently. So I think the transition is possible. We think it's possible for a, a very small um, fraction of the resources that we're spending in very poor ways on the planet today. Um, and there's so much more we can do together. Caroline, yeah, from um, your experience <laughs> working with farmers in Africa, how to make this transformative? So I just really want to add to what she said. And uh, every day I want to speak from a consumer perspective because we, um, I want to speak from a consumer perspective because the farmers are doing what they need to do. But how then do we give the farmers power to actually continue doing what they have to do? And I think from a consumer perspective, it's really ensuring that we make the right decision every day. So every day you're consuming something, every day we are eating something. How then can we ensure that we make the right decision to buy a product that has been sustainably produced? Uh, because the one thing I think farmers have been saying is it's a bit pricey and a bit unfair to let them, you know, foot the cost alone. But if we as consumers actually make the decision every day to consume a product that has been responsibly produced, sustainably produced, then we're actually just giving them the power back to their hands and telling them, you're doing a good job, keep doing it. Thanks. Harriet, same question from where you're sitting. How to make this transformative? Well, I was actually wanting to pick up on this question of who pays. And I, because I think that's absolutely fundamental. This can be transformative, but the $100 million question, or probably more, is who's going to foot the bill to enable smallholder farmers to make that transition? 
Because even if in fair trade you get a premium above the market, nonetheless, these are smallholder farmers who don't have the additional capital resources to make the kind of investments that it's going to need to make that green transition. And actually to make the green transition and then to sustain it thereafter. So it sort of strikes us there are, there are four possible places where we could go for that finance. And uh, I'm going to throw it over to the audience for a highly random subjective vote. <laughs> so we reckon the four places you could go to finance this green transition would be the consumer. Should we all pay more for our food? The brands, the traders, the retailers, the companies who take the product from the smallholder all the way through to you and me. Then we've got the farmers. Should the farmers be paying? It's their future, it's their land. And then we've got government and private philanthropy. Could they make, put up the capital to help make this leap possible? So, okay, you've got one vote each, starting now. Who wants to vote for the consumer? Oh, very unpopular. One, two, maybe three, a little bit hesitant. <laughs> actually, it might be interesting in the Q&A to actually hear from people why. But okay, so the consumer, a little bit hesitant. Okay, next up is the brands, the retailers, the companies. Oh, they're definitely gonna have to dig deep. <laughs> Okay, what about the farmers? And I hope you're playing this game at home as well, if you're watching online. Uh, and I can tell you, no, anyone for the farmers? Oh, what you? Yeah, mm -hmm. the farmers are getting off quite well here. And what about, oh yeah, one or two, yeah, one or two. And what about government and private philanthropy? Yeah, yeah, we've got a nice sprinkling there. I think that might be right. Yep, all of the above. She's after all of the above. And that is, yes, okay, that's getting more votes. That is probably the right answer. We probably need those mix of resources. Because some of the capital investments to put up renewable energy, to install, uh, you were giving me the example, Juan Pablo, of uh, a group in Tunisia, Desert Joy they're called, growing fruits in Tunisia. Well, they're using solar energy to desalinate seawater to irrigate their crops. It's probably the kind of example we're going to need to see more and more of as we have to adapt to the climate crisis. Those are major capital investments. So it may be that those kind of major investments we need to look to government, to the big climate finance bodies, including private philanthropy, to establish a fund a fair trade climate uh, investment fund to which the producers could apply either its loan or its a revolving loan or its actually straight out grants so they can make that first step. And then I guess the next bit of the continuation of that so that in 30 years time people have a sustainable livelihood from farming in a way that is climate positive Maybe that's where it comes in with the brands, the retailers, and the consumer and the farmers contributing to that shift. Certainly we know in the wealthy world, we're spending less and less of our income on food. It's, it's becoming smaller and smaller as we spend more and more on our housing, actually at the minute on fuel, but normally less on that, on, on other items, but not food. And it may be we just have to solve this conundrum of how do we enable the consumer to pay more for their food so that the farmers get a fair price and can farm sustainably, but without disadvantaging the really people on low incomes. That's the, the, the trick we've been wrestling with, and I think it becomes only more important when we look to this transition. Exactly. And that makes me... Uh, reflects a bit um, we have heard about actions that needs to be taken today that probably could have ta been taking place like 20 years ago uh, actually yesterday we had another side event and and, and and the closure the speaker said well the right time for plant a tree was 20 years ago but the second best time to plant trees today 
but also reflecting on how the market reacts to these questions and also the pos real possibilities in the communities, if producers are not receiving a fair income, a living income, they will not probably be able to pay for all the costs implied for climate change. So how we can pay for this? <laughs> well, how are we going to pay for it? Um, I think in the short term, we are looking at, in the short term, uh, we're looking at philanthropy. Uh, we're looking at government uh, donors. We're looking to find, really initially raise about 50 million to, to kick this program off, which is a tiny drop in the bucket. Uh, but I do think that there are profound structural problems with the financing of the world today. And if, I mean, just to, thinking of Jeffrey Sachs again, you know, the, 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 dislocation in where money needs to be. I mean, his, he, he cites the example that his borough in New York uh, has the same budget annually, which is 300 billion, that the whole United Nations has to deal with all these problems. So we have a, a real major problem. And there was a, a great expose about the Patagonia uh, donations that um, it turns out that, that it's going to save Patagonia uh, $1.3 billion in taxes if they make it a foundation and they still control it. And it's very distressing to see how the structures financially in the world are working at the moment against uh, really implementing some of these things. So I would say probably one of the really critical things if we want to think in the next 10 years is we actually have to solve the problem of tax. Um, again, Jeffrey Sachs has pointed out that if we just had a fair, transparent, and reasonable tax system, governments would actually have enough money to support these things across, across a w much wider board uh, in every country of the world. So that's a long-term goal, but we have to not forget that we cannot solve these big structural systemic global problems with philanthropy. Philanthropy is never going to be the answer there, even if it's government uh, support. Um, and so we do have to fix things like, like the tax problem. In the short term, though, um, we think that if we can mobilize um, a, a, a key amount of money, there are tipping points in all of these things. Um, so, you know, we believe that if we can demonstrate how cost effective and how energy efficient and how incredibly valuable this whole approach to farming and supporting small farmers and communities to have control of their energy, control of their agriculture in ways that enable them to get a fair price for their goods, that actually that will be the tipping point to make it possible for the rest of farming. Um, but I, I think we, we also need to make sure, um, and I guess this is probably the more important and realistic point, <laughs> which is uh, working together in partnership with organizations that can support farmers on the ground with these various things, whether it's energy or agricultural support, biodiversity protection or water, working with the right partners that can really work in tandem with farmers and local communities to solve these problems. I mean, just to give a couple of examples, the coconut producers I mentioned in Ghana with their very integrated plan, they reckon they needed $60,000 to implement that. So that's the kind of levels we're talking about to kickstart some of these processes. And then I think we do need to sit around the table with the brands and the retailers and consumer groups and talk about should we all be paying more in order that our food is sustainably farmed. And obviously now we're thinking in particular about smallholder farmers in the global south, but the question is also true actually in the Western world, where again, we've, the demand for cheap food is what's led to our unsustainable agricultural practices. And we've got to begin to have that discussion about how we pay both for the capital to initiate the transformation and then sustain it, and how the brands and the retailers that make big profits out of food, who are now looking to offer carbon, climate positive products, that is, they know that is the zeitgeist. That's the moment they need to respond to, to show that they've been working with their supply chain on renewable energy, on agroecology. They need to be ready to pay for that as well. And I think that also needs to be part of the debate. So in a way, is a fair share of risks and responsibility along all actors of the supply chain with the right financial mechanisms to incentivize, to promote, and to scale. Yes, and I love the fact you've pointed out the risks. 
because at the minute when everyone talks about this transition to a new way of farming, obviously that carries risks for fa smallholder farmers. A and th that, that's the danger, that that's what will hold people back because they've got no resources to take those kind of risks. So even a mechanism to help uh, take away the risk could also be part of helping enable this transition to happen. And in a way also w a way to demonstrate that trade can lead to decarbonization. Because that's what we are seeing, the discussion around scope three emissions and emissions generated in a, a producing level in the other region, but also along the supply chain, ways we can be efficient, produce better with a lower footprint. I think that's really a key point, uh, Juan Pablo, and that also reminded me that one of the other unique things about fair trade that I think is important way to, to pilot this whole approach to a systemic uh, system is, is that there is transparency and traceability across these supply chains for the, for the producers, for the farmers, for the traders. And having that transparency enables us to make sensible decisions right across and, and, and expose where the real value and the carbon carbon drawdown and the carbon investments are necessary and happening. And we can do that in a way that actually enables, you know, the world to understand why and how we're doing this and where those accountabilities, where that responsibility and where those investments are required to make this happen. I think is critical for all of us to, to know and trust that that what we're eating and what we're supporting is actually providing solutions to these problems and not adding to the problems themselves. Now let's move to you all. q and &A. So here in Incentive, if you have a question, you, you can get a product. So, <laughs> Chai, guys. Who got a question, Joe? Thank you. My name is Dale Lewis from Zambia. Um, and um, regarding the private sector, um, not all private sector actually has a lot of money. Um, we've been trying to de-risk um, the uh, incentives for farmers uh, to move into the regenerative farming practices uh, by giving them the kind of prices that would motivate them. My question um, is that in our, our company very much believes um, in fair trade. Um, we have uh, a lead farmer on our board. Um, we consistently give above market prices. Um, we spend a huge amount of money on training and mobilizing and organizing the leadership. When I wanted to apply for the fair trade um, certification, it was too expensive. And, and, and so I think there is a sort of a, a, a contradiction. Um, and, and I wondered if there was any opportunity for fair trade to look at mitigating the cost or in ways that we could pay after we demonstrate the profitability that would justify to pay for the fair trade. We'd love to have fair trade on our brand. We have 23 different food products. In 20 years, we've not made a, a profit yet. We have over half a million farmers, and we have moved them totally into agroforestry non-chemical. That's the paradox. It, it is, thank you. That, that's really, really uh, an important point. And, um, Others of my colleagues here might want to comment on this, maybe Melissa in the, in the conclusion. But what I would say is that um, these things are, are tipping points. And the investments that are necessary to create sustainable value chains right now, it's kind of like the investments of double glazed windows. You know, For a long time, they were more expensive uh, than single glazed windows. And now if you tried to buy single glazed windows in California, they would be more expensive than double glazed because there is a tipping point. And the challenge is, that actually what fair trade does in these value chains, it, 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 it does cost resources all the way along that chain to have the auditing, to have that independence, to have that analysis. And it's a very big challenge to get over that tipping point. So I would say 
keep, keep having the conversations with fair trade. We do everything we can to make it as, as cost effective as possible and we have more and more ways to help uh, companies, retailers to actually have, have ways of doing it that reduce the licensing part of it. The minimum prices and the premiums for the farmers are absolutely essential just because that's, that's really, you know, trying to angle towards a living wage. Uh, but it, it, is a, it is a system that is definitely more expensive than slavery uh, for all the right reasons. And it is a challenge but a reality that, that in order to do it properly, we have to be able to, um, to, to do it systematically and, and, and have robust auditing behind it. So keep up the conversation. We are reducing it in various ways, um, so especially the licensing end of those costs. So, so we hope to have more conversations with you, I'm sure. Uh, and I think your challenge is correct. There are, of course, many small and medium sized enterprises also in the food system who are also barely scraping by. And I think that's also why we believe it does need government and philanthropic capital to help make the initial investments. And it's worth thinking that in the end, and this is what we'd like to do more work on to understand it, in the end, it should help reduce the costs for smallholder farmer groups if they're using renewable energy, for example, because you're no longer having to buy diesel to power the drying machines in your tea factory, which is not only polluting, but is also incredibly expensive. Whereas, of course, renewable energy in the long run is the cheaper option. It's just you need that initial capital. Hi, uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, my name is Sarah Pima from Tanzania. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, most of these smallholder farmers are uh, women. And women, um, for example, in Africa, the land ownership is a problem for the most of the women. So how uh, is the sustainability part can it be? What is your advice? That is the first question. And uh, the second question is about the post-harvesting. We know in the process there's a lot of post-harvesting and this is challenge to sustainability as well as the climate action. And the final one is uh, on the, is it possible to have, uh, what is your advice on the standard uh, climate, uh, standard climate change, uh, standard climate compliance on our product or um, even the re in a regional level indicator compliance for the product, what do you think? Thank you. Those are three big questions. I'll tackle the first one and then we'll see if we, we might want to hand one of them over to, uh, so the first one in terms of women's access to land uh, ownership and, um, and access to that. Look, I would say that um, these are challenges all over the world um, and one of the ways that fair trade has uh, embarked on trying to address it is, is what we call the Women's School of Leadership. It actually started here in Africa uh, and it has been very impactful in Asia uh, and in Latin America as well. And the idea about it is to really help women understand what their um, roles, responsibilities, even rights are, uh, and enable them trainings that help with building confidence about how to engage in their communities in ways that enable that leadership to play a pivotal role. And in many fair trade cooperatives, what we see is that um, there is innovative ways to enable women to have their own plots, their own resources, and, and we have things like Cafe Feminina, for instance, which is completely women-owned um, coffee um, cooperatives, and <laughs> those tend to be actually uh, selling at a higher price and making a better profit. So there are many ways that we try to address these opportunities, uh, but this is, a, this is a lifelong challenge for women all over the world. I'll stop with that one. Do you want to... Yeah. I wanted to answer on post-harvest losses because I think that's a brilliant question. And as I think we all know, about 30% of all food is wasted. So actually going back to our initial problem is if we could only address the question of reducing waste, of that would actually help enable farmers to earn a higher income because you've got less going to waste. So uh, I just wanted to give you one example. At Ashton, we do the awards, and we just awarded a brilliant company in Kenya called Soko Fresh. And what they're doing is they've got solar-powered container in which the farmers can come together and bring their mangoes, store them in the container until the whole container is full. Obviously, they're smallholders, so normally they don't have so much. 
So the consequence is it's rotting before they can get it to us enough to get it to market on a lorry. But by having a cooler in this container, they can come together and then using an app, they can sell directly to the market at a higher price. Uh, and that, so it's that, again, it's going back to this question of integrated systems. But by having new technology combined with solar energy, combined with the farmers being organized, they've reduced post-harvest losses by 90%. I mean, it's phenomenal. And the consequence is they're making more money. Consequence is their income has gone up without having to do anything else apart from making sure the product is cool, the quality is high, and it gets to market directly. So I think that's a really great point to highlight. It's part of that whole cycle we've got to look at. We can't just tackle one little bit. We've got to go right the way through. A and then your second question is the challenge that I think we're all wrestling with. How do you then talk about that on your products? How do you tell the consumer if a product is climate friendly? How do you tell them if it's actually reduced the carbon footprint, which is something Juan Pablo has really led at fair trade? And maybe now the moment has come that the consumers would be interested in that. There's always a concern the consumer thinks, oh my God, there's so many labels, it's anti-slavery, it's fair trade, it's good for the panda bears. And, 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 that, and now we want to talk about the climate as well and there's no room on the product anymore to say anything else. So that's what we've wrestled with. And I think part of this collaboration is to think how could we, and that's, by the way, we need everyone's help. This, we're, this is open house collaboration, we want everyone to help join this ambitious project because it's going to need so many brilliant organizations and brilliant minds to go from the, cons the farmer and the changes they make all the way through to how do we talk about it to the consumer. But also, I would say, we want to make sure we invest as much in farmer to farmer to communication because so often the storytelling, the communication, it's all going to the consumer and farmer to farmer is not getting enough resources and attention and not getting the best and the most brilliant communications. So we want to, we want to do both. Sorry, uh, can I add to that? Um, so also, I, I think I, I'd want to uh, mention something on women. Uh, so apart from Women's School of Leadership, one of the other things that we are doing is really encouraging and empowering women to, you know, to actually own the process. So you might not own the land, but what else can you do? There's value addition. You can, you know, you can actually work somewhere across the supply chain. So um, there is a Wadi Coffee where I'd mentioned uh, where women are actually processing the coffee. And what women have done is they don't own the land, but their husbands have given them coffee bushes. So, and that's why it's called Zawadi. Zawadi is a gift in Swahili because the women were gifted the coffee bushes. In Ivory Coast, we have women who have come together because the issue is access to finance, access to funds, right? So they've come together, used their fair trade premiums and actually bought a piece of land and they're making money out of it. Again, in Ivory Coast, we have women who do not own the land but are actually value adding the cocoa. So they're doing cocoa, um, you know, they're actually doing uh, cocoa butter, they're doing chocolate and all that. So sometimes it's really not about owning the land, it, what can you do with what we have? And so women coming together and really being empowered to think outside the box and realizing that you can make money even if you don't own the land, you can still contribute into, you know, into the supply chain. She see what's happening here. People are asking three questions, hoping to get three bars of chocolate. <laughs> uh, I, they, those were great points, Carol. I just want to thank the, the, that question um, about the food waste. I, I think that, that, it, that answer was actually just a beautiful example of how integrated these problems are and why we have to do these things in a new way in order to transform the outcomes here. And I just think that's a beautiful example. We should actually use it in future, but I wanted to thank you for asking that question because it, it, it is a really important way to help us also articulate how, how and why this new approach is, is a valuable outcome. And Caroline, that was great. Hi, um, I'm a reporter from Ireland. So I was really interested when you touched upon the impact that smallholder farmers are having and obviously they would work more closely with nature so I wondered would fair trade advocate for a system 
that's more based around smallholder farmers rather than the huge mega farms we see popping up across the UK and Ireland. And I'd love to know what you think farmers in the UK and Ireland could learn from farmers across, across Africa. And just another slight thing as well. Um, I know we've also had situations where we've seen some very large companies move away from fair trade in recent years. And, and that's a really important thing. I think when I buy something, I think I'll buy fair trade ahead of something else. What, what, would, what message would you like to give to consumers about the importance of that label and why they should choose fair trade above everything else? Thank, thank you. I'll just answer the first one if you want to take the second one. Um, just in terms of the first one, I do think there's a lot that farmers in the north can learn from the cooperative farmers in the fair trade system and in the south. Um, uh, in New Zealand, we have a terrific example of uh, it's a, a Fonterra. It's actually a dairy company that enabled small farmers in New Zealand to become connected in cooperative structures that are exactly like what fair trade does for small farmers in other places. And in doing so, they enabled the dairy farmers there to get a fair price for their milk and to save and, and preserve the family farm. And if you think about the way the US has addressed and Canada has addressed and Australia has addressed these agricultural challenges, what they have done is just wipe out the family farm and, and agglomerate these mass industrial farming processes that, that have actually caused an awful lot of the soil problems and the uh, unsustainable uh, harvesting pr uh, processes that we have. So I think that fair trade does have a lot to offer uh, you know, Western farming methods and, and that it is actually quite important and quite valuable that communities have, and I think we learned this in, in the pandemic, there are certain things that every community needs in their community and, and having access to, to you know, food is actually one of those things. And, and so farming methods that are not reliant on, on food that's coming millions and you know, millions of miles away, but actually enables local farmers to sustain themselves uh, in both contexts is I think a really important thing. And it is, it is possible to do that without uh, totally eliminating uh, the family farm, even in places where it's already gone. I'd just like to build on that, that I also think uh, what's amazing about what smallholder farmers do across Africa, Asia, and Latin America is the depth of their commitment to organization. They're organized into cooperatives, associations. That is a tough thing to do. I don't know if anyone here has ever worked in a co-op, but it isn't easy. Oh, yes, our producer friends at the back are making faces. <laughs> it's not easy working in a cooperative. And yet these farmers have done that in order to secure the position of smallholder farmers in these enormous global supply chains. And that's what I think our smallholder farmers back home in UK and Ireland can learn. Above all else, organized, because at the minute, they're often working very individually, often almost in competition with their neighbors. So I, for me, that would be the key. And that's why we believe working with the fair trade movement, which is all organized smallholder farmers, is the key to scale climate positive solutions because we can reach these farmers and the farmers can share with each other because of their commitment to organization and working collectively, not each person with their little tiny plot. I, I think I want to answer the second question by saying that the, the benefit of fair trade is that it's an independent certification. It's half owned by the farmers and workers and half owned by the consumer movements of the developing country but it's totally independent. And co many companies are doing many, many brilliant things. But how on earth are you and I to know? If they claim to be the best company in the world, maybe it's true, but maybe it's not. We don't have any way to check. Whereas the independence of the fair trade mark enables you to know and trust that standards have been met and independently verified. And I think that's the reassurance it brings and that by being part of fair trade, you're part of a bigger movement to shift mindsets. And individual companies doing their own thing are not having that collective power where the total is more than the sum of the parts. That's what fair trade does. It brings together amazing work for farmers in Ghana and Latin America, together with consumers organizing in their town halls and their villages to shift how people look at these issues. And I think with fair trade 
offering these climate friendly solutions, it puts fair trade back on the front foot of where is public opinion and what are they asking for. And I would hope that the big companies would look back to fair trade again as part of the solution. Okay, thank you. You have seen the problems are multiple. It's not just responsibility of one, it's a shared core responsibility. Uh, and we are looking for partners that, to work with us to lower the cost and improve the efficiencies while at the same time we protect the environment and the people that live in those environments. So now I would like to introduce you to Melissa Duncan, our Executive Director in Fairtrade International, for a closer remark. Melissa? Maybe now it is. Okay, I'm going to try to speak up above this noise. And just a few minutes to close the session. I'm very pleased to be, um, to be here to do that. And thank you all for your brilliant questions. We really wanted to have a dialogue today. So we thank you for putting those forward and challenging us in that way. Uh, we're talking a lot about where we are in 30 years. And just for a second, I want to share with you where fair trade was 30 years ago because that journey matters, and the point that we're at now matters. And 30 years ago, we, um, we saw that the fair trade, we saw that the um, coffee farmers in Mexico were really struggling. And they were struggling to sell their, their coffee beans at a price which meant that they could actually live and feed their families. And this was the origin of fair trade, because the idea was to do something different to give the farmers the ability to um, earn a decent living and to invest in their communities. And that was the origin of the fair trade model. And today we have, you've heard, 1.9 million farmers and workers. They're working across 70 different countries. We have two and a half thousand brands and retailers, like the ones you see here that Caroline introduced us to, who are selling some 36,000 fair trade par products. We also have the most, uh, widely recognized and trusted sustainability brand in the fair trade mark. So this is what we've built in 30 years. Now we see that what is in front of us is the climate crisis, why we're here today. And we see that we need to do something different and ambitious to also tackle this issue. And you've heard Harriet and Molly talk about how we need to look at the, the full systemic problem and tackle it together. And we think fair trade and um, Ashton as a solution to start to do that is, is a really good base. Because what we also have is we have the producer networks across the system. We've spent 30 years building up the structures on the ground. And every time a fair trade producer is certified, they automatically become a voting member of that producer network. And they have rights to the services on the ground. So this is part of the core of fair trade's infrastructure. And then we see the need for understanding the, the full carbon footprint and what we can do to encourage better use of energy and coming together. So this is the, this is the origin of this. This is something new that we want to do and something um, uh, ambitious that we have. And these questions that we introduced today are the ones that we've been holding in our head and grappling with. So we wanted to open those up and share with you. Because the fundamental vision is how do we take smallholder farmers, scale that up in a way which doesn't take another 30 years, but we, we move much quicker because we do it together with partnerships so that we can achieve value, value transfer of the positive work that the producers do in the area of carbon sequestration, for example, meaning that they get more value and that we have a solution to, part of solution to the climate change problem. So this is how we see it. Now this is something that we're stepping into the arena with. There's some risk here. We think we've got uh, the basis for a great solution and we would invite anybody who wants to come along on this journey with us because we are going to need tech expertise, expertise, technical expertise. We are going to need more capacity building. And of course, we're going to need funding. And I think it was um, great that everybody had to give a consideration to actually where does the responsibility for that sit? And it must be collective, right? We must all do that. So this is, the, um, this is what we're um, offering today. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, joining us in this session. Thank you particularly to Harriet, Molly, Juan Pablo, and Caroline 
for taking us through the, um, the questions and the challenges, and we wish you all a great rest of the COP. <laughs>